Okay, so now I'm recording. Whew. All right. Well, at least what I said was in the newsletter. Um, but okay, so we're recording. Well, I'll just say for those who are not joining us live today, who will be watching the replay, welcome to our speculative design session on creating compelling narratives of future worlds. Um, you just missed a sort of five minute bit that I had on uh, why speculative design is so important. If you're just watching this briefly, I forgot to press record. However, um, we will be publishing a blog post and, and if you have our newsletter, you would have heard about it today, uh, the things that I just brought up. So back to um, our session. So this is our agenda today. We're going to cover um, three key components, everyday things, time traveling and participatory futures, and then we'll have our activity session. But before we start, um, the reason, I just wanted to quickly say that the reason why we do these futuring labs openly to everyone is, well, you know, obviously we want you to know more about what we do at the Trend Atelier. We're a school and community hybrid for uh, foresight um, professionals, but also for creatives. But we're also very dedicated to futures literacy through our commitment to the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. We have four commitments. We're part of the uh, their partner network. We're members of the Conscious Fashion and Lifestyle Network. And so as part of this, one of the things that uh, I've I created uh, with the partnership of learning designer and listening heavily and leaning a lot into the community, which was amazing. We had a small pilot program on this and I've learned so much from our members. So thank you. We created what's called the world building framework and it's really designed to support future and creatives and foresight professionals uh, in different stages in their journeys. We have four pillars that you can see here. I can see a uh, few are, are, are hidden, but there's mission, vision, methods, principles, um, inside out sustainability and expression influence is the sun that you see on the end. And so today what we'll look at is more about um, in our methods and principles aspect of what we do. Um, so I'm super excited to share also, and that's what I wanted to say before I jump in, that we actually uh, just released a world building questionnaire open to everyone. It's a very, very quick quiz that um, is on this page. And if you wanna go um, take it, you can then receive, you can identify if you fit into one of the four archetypes and then um, you'll receive a personalized futuring journey. Futuring journeys are step-by-step gu uh, -step guides that we have in the in in Trend Atelier, and we're doing some specifically uh, for people who sign up to this questionnaire. So, without further ado, um, with speculative design, I would say first we're we're looking more at long-term futures because imagination is in the driver's seat, and we're really trying to to push ourselves outside of our comfort zones in terms of what we think is the future. And, um, but I love this quote by Marina Gorbis for the Walker Art Center. And she said, um, the more equitable futures begin with imagination, which is a great way of, of, of uh, explaining why speculative design can really power a very ethical approach to future trend force site. And Lewis Hyde, professor and author of the book, The Gift, Creativity and the Artist in the Modern World also said, the imagination creates the future. And so we need to really think and feel conditions that we haven't lived through before and challenge ourselves when it comes to speculative design. So speculative design stages different future scenarios and it's actually can be more accessible than, than most people think. So we have to um, look at, first of all, the fact that the future is altered, the future context is not the same as the present. So think of a big difference, not an amplified version of the present. The future is plural, any vision of the future is only part of it, therefore incomplete. So there, there, there's plurality in the future and emotive. We often fail to implement because there's a, a split between how we represent futures and real life situations and how we feel futures. How many of us have um, delivered amazing future forecasts to big companies or small companies and nothing gets done? Because people don't really empathize with those futures, just more information. So really, 
what I most love about future uh, about speculative design is that it it makes us think more. Um, who are we forecasting for? You know, it, because it's so embedded in every day the everyday world. And um, again, what I said earlier when I wasn't recording for those watching the replay is the what if for the what what should. And uh, there's a quote, and I can't remember who who said it, but I love this quote because it's it's also putting the foresight professional who might not be a designer in a designer headspace because it's the idea that um, all acts of design are themselves small acts of future making. And without you having any sort of design training, you can employ speculative design. And, um, and as a side note, I also suggest that you watch the replay of one of our previous Futuring Labs, which was on creating future artifacts, which is a nice companion to this session. And uh, I will put it in the chat here. Um, if you want to check it out. So let's start with, like I said, there are three aspects, everyday things. That's the most common common um, way that we first anchor ourselves in, in uh, speculative design. And I'm not sure if some of you are familiar with Timothy Morton. He's an ecological philosopher, but he has this book called The Stuff of Life. And he's very future facing in his approach. And it's basically a book that talks about um, the many ways you can tell the story of a life. And that's what you're doing with speculative design. You're telling the story of, of, of life in the future. And uh, he does this in this book through the objects that shape and punctuate uh, life and really tell the story of our world in these like mundane objects. Even this microphone here that I'm using, it's, it's very much timestamped to today and the life that we have, et cetera, et cetera. So objects are things in their richest sense. They are beings, non-human beings. They have a presence and a force of their own. So although this book is not about speculative design, I think it's a nice way to frame the importance of everyday things. So for example, the Institute for the Future this is one example. They're really, they're an amazing organization. I highly recommend you check out their newsletter. Uh, they're also more known as IFTEFF. And so they, they uh, teach speculative design and uh, amongst other things. And so this is an example uh, that they, they shared in a session, which is called, it's a future menu for future approach to, approach to food. And so it's called the Syntharian menu because there aren't just vegetarians in this future or um, there or there are syntharians, so people who eat synthetic food, uh, because this is potentially a future with food scarcity and we're bio bioengineering food. So this is the menu of this uh, place called synthetical nutrition, which is not real. And you can see through the stamp here that it's it's um it's in 2032 because that's when their certification is. So through these small little touches, you are transported into this future. Another example is from Extrapolation Factory, uh, and it was on climate. It's, it was a project called Climate Futures 2020. What what kinds of climate action do the next generation envision? So this is actually a partnership with a, a group of youths to really imagine what different things we could have in our everyday life. So this is a phone booth transformed into a corn clothing printer. And so although this is not quite possible yet, it kind of transports you in a world. There were other examples on, the, on this project, which you can look up. I'll put the link in the chat as well. Um, this is possibly my favorite of recent days because I actually only discovered it 10 days ago and it was at the um, uh, graduate show for Central St. Martins. And this is by um, George Hopkins, who is an industrial designer. His, his portfolio website is actually really amazing, but sadly he didn't have uh, images of this project anywhere on his socials or, um, so you have to deal with my crappy photos, sorry about that. <laughs> But basically, uh, this project is uh, a cooking strategy for surviving in 2050. And it's all around the shepherd's pie, which is, you know, a staple food in the UK. 
And so our relationship with food is changing. That's what the project highlights due to global warming and the spread of new diseases. And so this is going to really affect the cooking processes and food types that we're accustomed to, putting them at risk unless we adapt. So this project provides the strategy for surviving up until 2050 through the lens of 10 ways of cooking a shepherd's pie at different times. And so these are a timeline. So this is a shepherd's pie in 2026. This is a shepherd's pie in 2041. This is a shepherd's pie in 2050. And you can kind of see on the side uh, the different tools, uh, the different ways of cooking it. And so uh, the, the ways we'll have to, to kind of modify our ingredients to create this very staple food of the shepherd's pie. So then what I love, and you'll see on the next slide, is that there's... Uh, a timeline, and there's also some booklets. So see, these are other future artifacts that he created aside from this cookbook. So we've got the cooking tools for the, these adapted cooking tools for the future of when we have to cook the shepherd's pie, the different cooking uh, tools also for this future, he created the packaging. So there's the pie portion control kit, because this is a future where we need to control our portions. This is the modern cook's rule book, the standard for good and proper behavior in the kitchen. It's a fictional book, but it's, it's set in the future, a future where we really need to be careful about our consumption. It was a beautifully executed book. I don't have all the pictures of it here, but this was a page about reduced water consumption and what you had to do in order to, to, to follow the rules and cook your, your shepherd's pie. So that kind of gives you an idea about everyday objects and how they can anchor us into the world of the future. And this is what is very, very common in speculative design. And if you wanna read sort of the Bible on this, it's speculative everything uh, by Anthony Dune and uh, Fiona Rabbi who kind of coined this term and are behind this practice. Design fiction and social dreaming is the subtitle. That will have a, a lot of examples that you can see in there as well. So another key aspect is um, time traveling. So there's a piece on this. I loved this idea of time travel and also putting in the chat the, the piece on this, the article on this. So you can see here with George um, uh, the, the George's project, uh, on industrial design and the shepherd's pie, the timeline. I actually thought this could be also an amazing way of framing a future trends project. I, I hope you can see kind of it. I know that the picture is not great and I apologize about this, but the top is the description, the story events, the constraints, rules, acts, adaptation, invention, the factors, climate change, overpopulation, new diseases, and then the events, food shortage, war, drought, it's a bit dystopian, but um, disease, crop failures, biodiversity loss, the great drought. I mean, we say that it's dystopian, but in some ways it's quite realistic. It's just inconvenient because it's saying things people don't want to hear. So, and then you can see this timeline that he created, but I think actually this could really be applicable even for a foresight project. Um, so, and so this is another way where uh, some employ actual staging. And I know that that's not what we can all do, but this is quite a famous, probably one of the most famous projects by Superflux called Mitigation of Shock. And it's a future in a London apartment. So they created this food where it's pets as protein and new me. And, and this is uh, basically a future London apartment where you have to grow your own food inside, et cetera. So, by bringing people into this world, they're transported. They've done a ton of other installations for like, for example, the future of work with different scenarios, different types of installations. And obviously um, us mere mortals who may not have access to creating such an installation uh, don't fare because there are other ways that you can employ speculative design. This is a more recent one that I've shared before. So sorry if you've seen it before, but you know there aren't a million examples of speculative design out there, although, Actually, the podcast that you suggested, Lillian, um, on design fiction uh, by Julian Becker, I don't know if you have the link in the chat, is amazing for that, for really discovering. He's more into design fiction, which is kind of like a, a, a sister brother or whatever of speculative design. But Abundance uh, Sages the Life 
in London in 2065. And it's actually a movie, but there was an exhibition at the uh, London Design Festival last year where they had the 3D printed um, bicycle. They had they took objects that are, have already been designed today or prototypes such as this um, mushroom farm that you can have in your house, but then they pushed it out in the future. And it was never openly said, but it was kind of sensed there had been some kind of event, a big flood or something like that. And, and London had to rebuild. And so there was there were a whole collection of posters, Cele celebrate Harvest Eve with the Bethnal Green allotment community, because it's a future world where in London, we also have to farm a lot. And so we work, we do our jobs, but part of what we do is also farm for our communities. This is a project I did with Days Beauty and Selfridges, uh, where I had a written profiling of what uh, future beauty tribes would be per decade in the next hundred years. And then um, digital artists uh, actually rendered this, which I can give you the link also here, uh, which, which was amazing. Um, Isabel, who's a, who's a really famous, I'm blanking out on her name, sorry about that. Um, let me just make sure I credit people correctly. Yeah, Lucy, um, that's it. Her name was, is Lucy and she, she's an amazing, uh, she's an amazing makeup artist. Sorry, I'm losing my thought because I really care about, um, crediting people properly. And this was digital artist, uh, George Jasper here, who, um, who rendered this. So, so, and her last name is Bridge, Lucy Bridge. Sorry about that. So I, you know, this speculative design can be a collaborative project where maybe you're more into speaking or audio or writing, and maybe you collaborate with other people to do the visual rendering. This is a podcast I was um, I was part of that recently came out that was hosted by Boston Consulting Group. And the episode is called Green is the New Black and it's basically set in the present in 2050. And I had to speak as myself as if I were in 2050. So there was a lot of prep, a long prep call where I talked about my research, et cetera. And then during the actual recording of the podcast, I had to talk as if I was in that future. So it was actually quite a lot of work, but but really exciting. And there's a number of other voices there. And uh, you're just transported. There's audio. It's it's a complete uh, experience, this podcast in storytelling. And then finally, it's about participatory futures as well. So in the trend activity, for example, this is a screenshot of our, acti our activity board for our pilot program for world building. Before the world building framework came out, I actually tested it with some of our members um, in a pilot program. And so we did some, some speculative design activities. For example, one that uh, is, works always really well is when you set the place. So for example, we had one where you are in Amsterdam. The day is November 8th, 2035. Um, choose the place you're in. We kind of almost pick cards. Um, is it a park or are you on a in a shop or are you in an apartment? Are you 15? Are you 30? Or are you 75? And then we would figure out what that would create like kind of a framework, the options that um, who, would of who would participate would have options in terms of their age and their location. And then they would start adding uh, into that story and their contacts. And then we had different activities, which then, for example, because we had a lot of shared research, we also um, had members review each other's research and then tell narratives based on other people's research. So it's also kind of like trying to get yourself out of your own navel kind of thing and look at other, what other people are doing, ask questions like reenact. Okay, this is Lil Lillian's research. I've never seen it before. What is she talking about? Okay, maybe this is this future or this and that. Uh, and, um, and always the thing is to not overthink it because this is also about gamification. And that's why card games are really good. So for example, the Situation Lab has a popular game that was also used in the Futures Bazaar, I think, by the BBC. It's called um, the uh, 
the thing from the future. And this is a great video by Stuart Candy, who's the co-founder of, of uh, the Situation Lab that you can watch as well, where he talks about this. But there's another um, card game that's not featured on this slide that I love called T the tarot cards of tech. And so empl employing gamification allows you to get into this multiplayer mo mode where you, you can uh, normalize play, you can invite play, you can get less serious uh, and, and just explore, you know? So this is um, basically each card you don't know what's going to happen because it's trying to also set you into mode where you're surprised because the future is altered. So you don't know what's gonna happen. You pick four cards, you have to pair them, and then you have to exercise that imagination muscle, which is what is so wonderful about uh, speculative design. And then the final example is one that, um, it was kind of me and Trend Atelier and Plurality University and Fashion Act Now, who I'm a founding member of, and it was um, this idea of creating your own alternative fiction around fashion. And here is uh, the link. Actually, I'll also send the link to Green is the New Black podcast. I'll share both of these in the chat. But essentially, this was held in November 2021, actually, in, uh, when we were still really heavy into the pandemic. And I, I did this story with Sarah Arnold, who's one of the major instigators of Fashion Act Now and, and Extinction Rebellion. And then we asked Trend Atelier members to basically, uh, we said, okay, it's the 16th of November, 2041, and you work in fashion and you need to, we, we call them fashion triggers. We asked them to come into this workshop that we hosted at Plurality University and basically pretend that they were people joining us from the future. So say there was Rachel Taylor and she joined as herself, but as herself in 2041. She talked about what she does, what she wears, what she does in fashion. And so these were called fashion triggers. And then we invited workshop participants to ask questions to their to these fashion triggers, to interview these fashion triggers. And then we had a bunch of suggestions if they weren't sure quite to ask. So they were having a dialogue with uh people traveling from the future, essentially. And that, that was really fun. So we have some time to do a bit of an exercise really around creating your own narrative of a future world um, and, and really getting tapping into that feeling that the future is here. So I'm going to read something to you and turn, turn off my, my screen sharing and uh, and I'm going to read this brief text to try and like immerse you into this world. And it's actually an edited version of what we did with Plurality University. So I'm going to read it to you now. And it's more fashion based because uh, this particular uh, focus was on clothing. But here we go. So just imagine that you are in. Um, hold on. It's June 27th, 2041. Today, the world is far different from 2021 when the sixth assessment report by the IPCC came out. Within two decades, millions of climate refugees have fled sacrificed regions. New communities seeking to survive climate woes aimed to live mindfully and preserve self-expression by new societal roles and landscapes for personal identity a wave of challenging the global system in which we trade, buy, consume, shop has taken place. Nothing seems permanent anymore. People are on the move, looking for stability and safety. Our aim is resilience in the face of uncertainty. Within two decades, we organized in a mad rush to engineer a new world, a new fashion, more focused on nature, equality, and community. Different communities have developed different clothing cultures. When communities come together, it's colorful and diverse. Clothing is personal, but it also signifies the collective you're a part of. Nothing is disposable. We create together, so everything has meaning. The early 2020s was all about the individual. And we used to share self selfies on Instagram. And it's funny, everything that used to be valuable is now worthless. Who cares if your shoes are a rare limited edition Balenciaga Gucci collaboration? Now it's all about regeneration. How, 
we all used to wear the same mass produced clothing. We are now trying to make the best use of all the clothing produced before 2025, but so much is of poor quality. So we have to be creative and skillful. Some people are still involved in capitalism, but it's not necessarily domi the dominant system anymore. Some innovation, innovative fashion companies such as Pangaea and Story MFG survived the event, but most didn't. How could most global brands survive without cheap plastics? Most of us work for our communities, not the global market. And together we are self-sufficient. Each community has diverse skills within it. And when D-Fashion started, communities included skills such as mending, designing, knitting, but also every clothing user had a role. Through collaboration with the user, we learn about real needs. And then we added farming. We then had some new wool and linen, but also food. And the big step was changing the nature of home ownership but we got there. Back in the 2020s, people thought technology and efficiency would save us. Emissions kept rising until we realized we needed to learn to live sufficiently. So, okay, so let's start our activity. There is my... Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, I hope you can see it. Can you see it, everyone? Yeah. So pro project yourself in the present future. So this means basically as if the future is the present. And like I said, the day is June 27th, 2041, and you're here from the future to tell your story. So I would suggest right now you take whatever you need to write and uh, write in the present tense. This is key because you are in the present. You're, you're coming here from the future. And so what I'm going to ask you to specify is who you are, your age, your, your gender affiliation, your profession, family, place or community. Maybe it's not family, but where is there a place or a community you're from, you know, or do you identify to? And once you've written that list down, I want you to write what you are wearing and why. So if that's okay, I'm going to limit this to five minutes instead of seven. I think it's doable um, just to kind of make sure we have enough time for the next activity. So just remember you have to um, right in the present. And so the next activity, we have 15 minutes allocated. So is that clear for everyone? Yeah, I'm gonna keep the slide up in case you need it as a reference and I'm going to, to, to mute myself. So welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm excited to see what's next. So So now I'm going to ask, so we have uh, 14 minutes for this. I just have a little message for you at the end. So I'm going to ask people to come forward and introduce your future self to the group and speak in the present tense and, and share what you wrote. So would someone like to volunteer first? And um, I know that this is the moment where things get quiet. Please don't make me pick someone. I can go. Amazing. Thank you, Nayara. You're always so It's going to be super welcoming. I had fun writing this. Okay, so I'll just ask if mm -hmm. you can maybe, can you think you can share in two minutes? Because what would be fun yeah, 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 yeah. is if yeah, afterwards the group asks your future self some questions. If, if anyone has okay. questions, they want to ask Nayara's future self. 
in short. So I am 54 years old. I'm a beauty statistician. I have two cats and two dogs. I live in a, in the countryside house close to the city though. I'm by the pool hanging out with my friends and enjoying some food. I'm wearing a bikini that doesn't let me feel cold in the water. Okay. Who wants to come forward and ask uh, Nayara a question? Uh, where did you get the bikini from? I need this also. <laughs> and that's a good question. I Maybe I, someone made it for me. <laughs> I didn't think about it. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. That's something to weave into your future scenario then, Nayara, maybe. Definitely. You see that it's a Brazilian suffering in the Nordics. <laughs> yes. For some context, Nayara is Brazilian. <laughs> um okay great anyone else have any questions for for Nayara no if not that's okay would like someone else like to come forward and and tell us your about your your future self in Anne-Mary I'm Anne-Marie, a grandmother and keeper of cultural stories. I'm 66 and my gender is irrelevant. My hormones have plateaued and equality has fin finally been established. I still use my talents to connect and communicate across various communities, um, especially spiritual, spiritual communities and design communities. I'm wearing a tunic that is made from prints and patterned fabrics that, are, that tell the story of my family and my career as a textile designer. Amazing. Would anybody uh, like to ask Anne-Marie some questions? Uh, okay, I have a question for you, Anne-Marie. So this, um, what you're wearing that represents your family and your history, are they symbols? Is it like a, are they, is it kind of like a different language with symbols or? No, I imagine it to be the repurposing of all the surplus pieces of fabrics that are maybe woven together. Um, maybe they make a pattern that has like a new like feral kind of story or um maybe it's like a you know like the patchwork quilts that you see um in america so is this um garment part of the storytelling also that you share across communities yeah i think that it can be used to be a visual prop in that storytelling of my spirituality, my faith, and also design. Amazing. Um, interestingly, at the Central St. Martin, I'm just going to jump back in the present for a second, but interestingly, at the Central St. Martin's um, industrial design show, there was something very similar with where um, a man from Nigeria, I forgot the, oh, I have the name of the project right here. Um, and so he is called, uh, his name is Wakra, Wakra Chinsaka, he's from Niger, Nigeria. And um, uh, I can't, I have the QR code here if you wanna scan it. But basically this robe, all the symbols were created with his tribe as part of a collaborative project. And he then created these robes and this new pattern to um, create modern symbols around this tribe and it's hard to see but it's basically a lot of symbols that you see in the stripes and those mm -hmm. are actually he created like a modern language that represents his community he went back to Niger to create this um so would anyone like to to volunteer Mohammed? I'm about to turn 51 in 10 days. So these days I'm 
actually that's not true wait yeah it's true because what I, so these days i'm looking at what i've achieved what i would like to do for the next year i'm a true luxury living advocate and a craze director bridging gaps between heritage innovation and regenerative design i belong to a nomadic community i usually don't like to stay within the hustle but by my cliffside home and i sometimes move around for work I'm wearing my gracefully aging natural fibers that I've always cherished since I started scouting for special pieces in the late 2010s. I appreciate uh, redefining uh, true luxury and materials in a way that makes me so grace, uh, so grateful. And I also believe it's key to consuming better, living better, feeling better, being more impactful and happier. That's it. Awesome. Okay, I, I think you know what's next. If someone can ask, uh, do you have any questions for uh, for uh, Mohammed? What are the natural fibers that are predominant at this time? I would believe, okay, to me, I would still believe that natural fibers that would live long or high quality fibers that have been produced before considerably, maybe silks, maybe cottons, maybe linens, maybe was durable fibers that have been actually passed down and cherished and loved for years. Um, even though process, even though they, in their production, maybe they do consume a lot, but if they have already been pre-produced and cherished and cared for, you know, then they would continue to be there the same way that i keep my pieces for years and i um and i try to you know keep them looking for steam um so i guess we we have a amazing um i guess so it sounds like it seems like there's a recurring theme here that was probably very much inspired by the narrative that I read, which I, I know in some elements were was a bit dystopian, but you have to remember that it was uh, co-written with one of the leaders of fashion, of Ex Extinction Rebellion's fashion arm. So, um, but, but surprisingly, when I was at the uh, London Design Bien Biennial and the theme was the global game remapping collaborations, there was a law about living on a farm or living in rural spaces. And even the J Japan's booth, which you, you, as we know, Japan are leaders and ad early adopters of technology. There, they said the future is rural. That everything was about farming and rural living and bringing design into those rural spaces, bringing other types of profiles in those rural spaces, which is actually a big theme in the UK at the moment, even in the RSA of trying to decentralize the UK and, and make it less about just London. So, so I just wanted to say that because another thing that I saw multiple times at the London Design Biennial was around weaving and ancient practices and ceramics. And there were there was some virtual reality and there was a really cool installation by the US that was using augmented reality, but it was also connecting that very much with the story of nature and what becomes nature in this world of data. So long story short, in fact, sometimes we think something is a bit far-fetched or dystopian that it's already kind of happening. And uh, I'm trying to think of other projects, but yeah, just, just as a side note. So I just wanted to honor Peter's question. I'm sorry, uh, anne Mary, I'm gonna go back to you on this because I missed in the chat uh, uh, a question by Peter. So you're gonna have to sort of go back into the future. And Peter has a question for you. He said, um, could you describe the nature of spirituality in your context, please? Yeah, y you. <laughs> well, I think that um, science is now embracing spirituality and seeing that there's natural um, laws and truths it used to be um, opposed 
and now that they're taking all of these rituals and um, divine knowledge and um, truths and um, yeah they're they're not fighting against each other they're embracing them so whether that be Chinese medicine qigong or um, the practice of sabbath from the Jewish tradition um, that that's what I was thinking about does that make sense yeah uh, to me it, it makes sense I think I think um Peter said he enjoyed your intricate an answer. I love that lens. Did you, I've noticed, um, I don't know if any of you listen to the Ezra Klein podcast and it's really good. And he's, he's re returned to his uh, practice of Shabbat. Um, he, he does not work. He does not like he's, it's not just for religious reasons. It's to find himself again and, and feel centered in, in this fast changing world. So I, I'm curious, we have a, maybe a few minutes just to know how this, how this felt, if, if, if this was kind of engaging, if you feel you've learned anything, I would love to know, or maybe you have questions. We have like two minutes to chat. I'm, I'm also just quickly going to recap, forgot. So essentially what we talked about today is the mission of speculative design is ethics, creative foresight, systemic change is kind of like big ideas that it can really help unlock that. Look for everyday things as your pathway, sort of your catalyst for unlocking this future scenario. Like I said, this microphone, what does this say about this present? Um, participatory futures as well. Speculative design is better when it's collaborative even somehow. Uh, it's often informed by gamification and uh, staging, so it often involves multiple people. And a, an easy way into trying to employ it is to use the present tense. Semantics, language is so important. And so use the present tense. If, if you're using writing, which is an amazing way to, to do uh, speculative design, just think the future is here. I'm in that future. And it creates such a empathic experience of, of that future. So, um, so yeah, so, so thank you everyone. And I'm just going to stop sharing the screen and yeah, we have a few minutes if any, anyone wants to bring up something. Um, and, and yeah, I'll just say also that, um, you know, our community is always accepting new members if you're interested and we have our resources page also where we have the schedule for our next Futuring Lab. And I'm really excited to say that we will be soon reopening our forecast like a futurist course if, you're, if a community is too much of a commitment for you and you're more into the DIY self-paced uh, situation. So that's, that's it for me. But if you have like two extra minutes, I know we have like one minute to just uh, chit chat and 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 share or if you need to leave totally understand but we'd love to know how how this how this felt um i think for me this felt um hopeful because i live in seattle and so i'm steeped in like microsoft valve meta you know all of this augmented reality and as a person of um that loves very tangible textures and fabrics and design and I am um, I work as a trend analysis um, all of these future storytellings you know they can feel dystopian and you know kind of painful on the heart you know these are really there's a lot of hard things that we're going to go through but the stories that we can tell of hope and the imagination and our filter that we can bring to this um, creative process seems like taking, a, taking back the humanity of it. I hadn't really sort of explored this before. So thank you for opening a crack to me to look through and, you know, dive into more.
Yeah, if you haven't seen our future artifacts replay, it's on the website on our, our just put the website link here. And um, also, we have a, an article on speculative design that has a lot of references. That's kind of more like if you're into learning basics. And um, in our last Futuring Lab, we talked about the ethics of future forecasting, and we talked about the need to be inconvenient. And I think that's kind of what you're saying, you know, like, oh, we, we're scared to come across as dystopian, but mm -hmm. I also think there's a fine balance between good optimism and synthetic optimism that is just leading us to try and be blind and avoid the issues. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but thank you everyone. Thank you, Abby. Odetta, we didn't see your future scenario. Maybe you could post it in the community. Um, it sounds like you you shared it with Abby, but but not all of us. No, just <laughs> so um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, and um, see you soon. Hopefully in in July. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.